Hello Engineering Central, it's Mr. Bradshaw here again. This time we're going to talk about drivetrains. We're gradually building our robots up. So drivetrains, the learning goals are how to use friction to benefit your robot and how to set up different drivetrain configurations. Pros and cons of different drivetrain drive configurations essentially. So first off, one of the most important things that you need to understand before building any kind of a drivetrain for a robot is friction. Now again, we've all heard of friction. We probably understand what friction is inherently. Um, but it, in engineering terms, is the force that opposes motion when two surfaces rub together. So we've got little pictures of the skiers down there. Um, they both are experiencing friction little skier number A, skier A, I guess, this guy right here, will be experiencing less friction since he's on skis going down a snowy hill. This guy here is going to be experiencing a lot of friction trying to slide down a grassy hill, don't know how wet it is, in shoes or socks or whatever it is. So if an object has no forces causing it to try to move, there is no friction. So friction is about um, the force or like, friction is the force that opposes motion when two surfaces are rubbing together. Now there are a couple of different types of friction. You probably learned about this in science class or physics class, but static versus kinetic. And not surprisingly, you can probably figure out what that what those are. First up is static friction. That's the fi frictional force between two objects that are not moving relative to each other. So if you've ever tried to move a heavy piece of furniture, the hardest part of it is getting it in motion to begin with. So that initial force that must be overcome to move something, to move something heavy, that's static friction. So you're overcoming static friction when you're getting something heavy in motion. On the other hand, kinetic friction is the frictional force between two, two surfaces that are moving relative to each other. So you've got that heavy piece of furniture in motion, now you're experiencing kinetic friction. So here's the difference between the two, a little, little diagram. Once an object has overcome that static friction and has started to move, it has kinetic friction acting upon it, which is resisting the motion. And as I mentioned earlier, static friction is actually greater than kinetic friction. So once you get the object to move, once you get that heavy piece of furniture moving, it's easier to keep it moving than to get it going in the first place. So that's static versus kinetic friction. Static versus kinetic friction. So a nice and easy demonstration of static friction versus kinetic friction is by rubbing the palms of your hands together. So if you push hard on your palms, if you exert a lot of force pushing them together and then try to move them, it's actually fairly hard to get them into motion. That's the static friction that you must overcome before they'll actually move. Once you do overcome that initial static friction, the kinetic friction is significantly less and your hands, the palms, should actually slide across each other quite quickly. That's because once your hands begin to move, you're only trying to overcome the kinetic friction and that takes less force. So static versus, static versus kinetic friction by pushing the palms of your hands together. So the grippiness of the surfaces, so if you're using, if you did that same demonstration with rubber gloves, you'd be increasing the coefficient of friction. So the grippiness of the surfaces is called the coefficient of friction and how hard the two surfaces are being pushed together. So how much force that you're exerting on the palms of your hands as you're pushing them together, that's called the normal force. So a coefficient of friction, as I mentioned, a, uh, wearing rubber gloves while you're trying to push the palms of your hands together, that's going to increase the coefficient of friction. A tire on ice, for example, has a low coefficient of friction. So the, 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 the grippiness or the slipperiness of the objects, of the surface, that's the coefficient of friction. Now, when dealing with robotics, you actually need friction to work for you as well. Without friction, you're not going to be very successful. With friction, of course, you have to overcome it. But without it, in the form of traction, you actually won't be successful at all. So traction is the friction between a drive wheel and the surface it moves upon. You need some friction. The amount of force a wheel can apply to a surface before it slips, that's, that's, that's traction. So different traction, you'll find different traction on different surfaces. We talked kind of about a tire on ice. Um, it's gonna have a lot more traction than tire 
or sorry, a tire on concrete is going to have a lot more traction than a tire on ice. So for robotics, you want to make sure that you're testing on the actual surface that the competition is going to be on. And luckily for us, we actually have that surface. So even if we go into international competitions, we will have the same surface in class as we will at competition. So how can you increase your traction? Well, it's kind of, it's always this balance, right? You want to be able to increase traction while decreasing friction, friction that's opposing your movement. But you do want to increase traction sometimes. The ways to do that are, well, twofold. You need to increase coefficient of friction. So in, if, you're, if you're wanting, wanting to increase your traction, grab the grippiest wheels you possibly can. Or even add other substances to them, like a rubber band, for example, will potentially increase the coefficient of friction on your tires. And then the other thing you can do is increase the normal force. So apply more weight to the drive wheels. If you remember in grade 10 when we did um, the uh, building a robot that can climb the steepest slope, essentially what you're trying to do there, one of the things that you're trying to do, you're trying to, um, to increase traction. Okay, before we really get into the drivetrains, let's cover a little bit of uh, terminology so that we can all speak the same language. First off, the drive wheel, that's the wheel to which power is transferred and is used to propel the robot forward. So not all wheels on your robot will be drive wheels. Some wheels are there for balance um, or maybe even turning. They don't actually help the move the robot forward. So the drive wheel is the one that is powered, that's moving the robot forward. The turning point is the point around which a robot is turning. And the turning scrub is the friction caused by wheels dragging sideways along the ground as the robot turns. So turning scrub resists the robot turning. So turning scrub is something you want to reduce. More terminology is a zero radius turn. So not surprisingly, that's when a robot turns with no um, with no radius really like it turns in place without moving forward the turning point of the robot is at the very very center of the robot and then the chassis the chassis is the structure of a robot that holds the wheels the motors and the gear train in place it holds it all together okay so now let's try and use let's try and speak the common language of drivetrains as we move forward There are a few different types of drivetrains that we can build in class. We'll talk about a few of them in turn. First of all, the Ackerman, the Skid Steer, the Swerve Drive, Crab Drive, and the Omnidirectional Drivetrain. So the Ackerman, you might be more familiar with this as the one that's in your car. It's a car style. In this drivetrain, all wheels move in the same direction. So it's either forward or backwards and they steer by turning the wheels in an arc around a single turning point. So the pro of this type of drivetrain is that there's no turning scrub at all, because the rear wheels actually will follow whichever wheels are turning. But the con is you cannot do a zero radius turn. The turning point will not be in the center of your robot. Another con of this would be that you require more motors. But this is the Ackerman style. It's an option. Um, we do have people who try that in class occasionally. Okay, here's the swerve drive. So swerve drive is essentially a skid steer with wheels that can be independently turned. Now this is kind of cool. It's really maneuverable. So massive pro on this is that it's very, very maneuverable. You can, you should be able to really, really tightly turn and control your turns. Significant con though is if you, if you look at all these these motors on this robot, we've got four robots or four sorry four motors controlling each of the four wheels, plus we've got four wheel or uh, motors that are controlling the turns as well. So a lot of motors are involved in creating a swerve drive. Okay, a crab drive is up next. The crab drive is essentially two sets of independent skid steers. I know we haven't actually covered skid steer yet, but I think you're all familiar with it. It's the most common type, and we'll cover it at the end just because it's the most common. But in a crab drive setup, you've got two independent sets of skid steers. Each one is pointed in the option opposite direction. So one skid steer moves forward and backwards. One skid steer moves left and right. Um, so if you don't actually have this working well, you're constantly creating scrub 
because you're always dragging wheels with you. However, if you build it such that you've got one drivetrain that's able to raise or lower, or possibly have omnidirectional wheels on it, then you might be able to get away with a crab drive. You're, the, the key there is that you have to be able to minimize the scrub or the, the friction that you're going to cause as you're moving forward and essentially dragging a drivetrain. So that brings us, I mentioned omnidirectional wheels, well that brings us to omnidirectional drivetrains. These essentially make use of wheels that can move in any direction at any given moment without actually having to steer the wheels. It does require these omnidirectional wheels. So essentially you've got a wheel here that spins, it can spin in this direction, but you've also got a whole series of little wheels on it that are spinning in this direction. So essentially this, this, this can slide sideways with low or minimal friction. There are a number of configurations that you can use with optional or with omnidirectional drivetrains. So in this scenario, these wheels can be moving in this direction. Well, these wheels can be moving in this direction. Sorry, I guess they can be moving in all sorts of different directions here. And in this scenario, same deal. These ones are going this way. And this one is moving this way. So by powering both sets of wheels, the robot can move in any direction. So this is actually pretty cool. Major con though, is that it requires a lot of drivetrain motors. So in this configuration, for example, in order to move forward, these two wheels both go in this direction. In order to move to the side, these two wheels move in this direction. And in order to move diagonally, you essentially have all wheels going and you can move in a diagonal. Okay, the skid steer. This brings us to the most common configuration that we'll see in class and probably in most competition robot robotics. Essentially, the wheels on the right and left sides are powered separately. So you'd have a motor right here, have another motor right here, potentially. The wheels are locked, so they actually don't turn. So these wheels can only move forward uh, in, in one direction, and so can these. So in order to actually make the turn, if you want to turn left, turn in this direction, you actually would just power these two wheels right here and not power these at all, or at least power them less, and you're going to make a turn. So significant pro there is that you can have a zero turn radius. If you've got your, your robot balanced properly so that the turning point is right here in the middle, then you can actually have a zero turn or zero radius turn. Power these motors on forward, these motors on in reverse, and it will turn. It'll spin around your turning point. So, as cool as skid steers are, and as effective and efficient and easy and common as they are, there are still some cons. First and foremost is turning scrub. Because you're powering the wheels separately, as one side of the robot versus the other side of the robot, those wheels will rotate, but they don't actually turn. So that means that every time that you're turning, you're powering, say, the right side of the robot forward, and you're powering the left side of the robot backwards. It'll spin, but it's dragging all the wheels along with it, creating significant scrub. You also require at least two motors in order to do this. But the turning scrub, all wheels are contributing to the torque, which is great, the turning torque, but they're also contributing to the turning scrub. So anytime that you're turning, you're always dragging a wheel or a set of wheels with you. That's creating friction, which you don't want. So one of the challenges that you're gonna do in class is to try to drive a really good, reliable, maneuverable turning drivetrain. So how can you do this? Essentially, you want to in, you want to maximize traction, so the friction that works in your favor, while minimizing scrub, which is the friction that works against you. So turning scrub is driven by the force of friction of the wheels sliding sideways. So in order to reduce this, you could use omnidirectional wheels that have zero or at least minimal sideways friction. Another option is that you can decrease distance of the distance of your wheels from the turning point. So with this in mind, a drivetrain like this, 
So we've got powered wheels here and omnidirectional wheels at the back, potentially. This, in theory, would have no turning scrub because these guys, these omnidirectional wheels, can either spin this way or move this way with minimal scrub. Now doing this, you're actually going to change your turning point. Your turning point moves from here, from the middle of the robot, to up here. But this could be a very efficient, maneuverable drivetrain. This would be a bad drivetrain, because here you've got, a long, you've got a long distance from your turning point. If your turning point's right here in the middle of the robot, every time that you're turning, if this is a typical skid steer, look how much drag or how much scrub you're creating with each wheel as it moves side to side. So a long, narrow drivetrain means that the wheels are a long ways away from your turning point, which means that you're increasing the scrub. So a high turning scrub and actually low turning torque. So this is not a well-designed drivetrain. A much better designed drivetrain is something like this, where you've got high turning torque so right now you're the the distance of the wheels from the turning point is actually quite minimal and as a result you're you're dragging them along a lot less when you're turning so you're creating a low turning scrub so typically speaking you want a short wide drivetrain rather than a, a long narrow drivetrain And then the last thing to consider is that all of these examples are actually quite simplified. There is no weight above the chassis. And in fact, our first challenge, we're going to actually just build a base chassis. We're not going to add a whole bunch of lift lifting mechanisms on top. But therefore, the turning point in most of these is going to be exact center because the, the robot is perfectly balanced. So bear in mind that when you start building things on top of your chassis, the turning point is going to be affected based on the difference between the wheels and based on the force, the normal force that's being exerted on those wheels. So the turning point is going to be impacted by the friction between the wheels and the floor. And this, in turn, depends on the weight resting on the wheels and the coefficient of friction of the wheels. So if most of the weight, for example, is towards the front of the robot, the turning point is going to move towards the front. So let's do a quick recap. In order to improve turning, in order to make a good, efficient turning drivetrain, you can adjust three things. The chassis geometry. So in other words, um, are you long and narrow or short and wide? You can impact or you can improve the, coefficients, the coefficient of friction between the various wheels, so get grippier wheels. You can also change or modify the location of the robot center of gravity. This is, of course, done by your normal force. Where is the weight going to be on top of your robot? And the last thing here, last thing that I want to mention, I'll end with this, is a little bit of a warning. Beware of overloading your motors. If you overload your motors, they're going to actually become quite inconsistent. They're going to stall. They may even burn out, which is not only inconsistent, but it actually, well, it becomes consistent because they just don't work at all, but it's also a lot more expensive. So when in doubt, gear your motor, gear your robots for, to move a little bit slower, so less speed, but also increase torque so that it can handle the load a lot better. Slow is better than no movement at all from stalled or burnt out motors. Nothing worse than sitting in competition and having your robots sitting there doing absolutely nothing. So hopefully this will help you to plan and build efficient, manageable, and maneuverable drivetrains for your robots.